So let's get started. So I'm going to call. Good evening, everyone. I'm calling the regular Temple City City Council meeting for December 21st to order. Uh, pursuant to, to Assembly Bill 361, signed by Governor Newsom, uh, city is allowed to hold city council meetings via teleconferencing, and members of the public can observe and address the meeting telephonically or electronically. To listen to the meeting telephonically, please call 1669-900-6833, meeting ID 811-1858. 2184, passcode 788155, or through the city's live webcast on YouTube. Connect with TC. Uh, Madam City Clerk, uh, would you please roll call? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Here. Council Member Mann? Here. Council Member Viscaro? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Here. Mayor Yu? I'm here. For those calling in, your audio will be unmuted during public comment and when public comment is open during an agendized item discussion. Public comment emails received prior to or during the meeting will not be read, but will be included in the record. Uh, at this time, we're very happy to have uh, Pastor Daryl Kelty uh, with the Community of Christ Church, located at 5851 Temple City Boulevard. Pastor Kelty will lead us uh, with the invocation. Pastor? It's always good to be with you. May we pray. Our divine creator, we thank thee for this world that you have created, even with our problems. We thank you for this beautiful but cold day that provides warmth and light to all we do this day. We thank you that we're able to live in this community in order to enjoy the benefits from all it has to offer us. For this reason, we would come into your presence this evening to ask your blessings and guidance upon all that we are about to do here this evening at this city council meeting. May this city council and its staff have your wisdom to be with them as they seek to do those things that would make this even better community. We know not what the future may bring, <clears throat> but would ask your creator that in all we do, that we do it good to the best of the community and to our abilities. We do this not just for ourselves, for the generations to come, those who are coming to this city to bring better city, that we might look, look to that future with hope, anticipation, with eagerness and a positive outlook, that those future generations may look back and say to each other with pride, that indeed we did a good job in preparing this community. This we do ask, even as you have led us to be. Amen. 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 Thank you, yeah. Pastor. Glad to do it. Yeah. Thank we, you, Pastor. Always, always, always available. All right. Uh, next, uh, shall please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. justice for all. All right. Next item is ceremonial matters. Presentation, there is none. Uh, we now move to public comments on item not listed on the agenda. Uh, so the time for public comments starts now. I'll ask any member of the public watching at home to call in at the Zoom number. Once you're on, the city clerk will make sure you are able to speak. Uh, Looks like there are a number of callers. So, um, Madam Clark, are there any public callers? And for those calling in, Mary, please say your name. There are three callers, and I've asked them to unmute if they wish to speak. 
Right. Call us, please. Unmute your phone or unmute your computer and um, state, please state your name. Okay, uh, it then seem like um, there are any callers, so well, nothing more from the public in a reasonable time having been given for them to call in. I will close public comment and move on to the next item on the agenda. Next item is the consent calendar. All consent calendar item may be approved in a single motion as recommended, unless removed for further discussion. If members of the city council or persons in the audience wish to discuss any matters listed on the consent calendar, please address them at this time. So, um, Madam Clerk, please start the timer. I will ask any member of the public watching at home to call in at the Zoom number. Uh, once you are on, the city clerk will make sure you're able to speak. Uh, now, while the public is calling in, are there any council member questions for staff? Okay. Um, we'll give it another moment or two. Madam Clerk, I need callers. Hear you. There are three callers, and I requested them to unmute if they wish to speak during this uh, segment of the meeting. Okay. Uh, can I? Uh, I'm, can I talk about the ordinance right now, or is that? No. Um. You. If you're talking about ordinance, well, you'll be given time at the ordinance. Okay. Speak. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, nothing more from the public and the reasonable time haven't been given for them to call in. I will close public comment. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Motion to approve. Second. Is moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, roll call please. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Vizcarra? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Yu? Yes. So con consent calendar has been approved. Uh, next item is public hearing. This is an item we carry uh, for from last meeting, which is the adoption of urgent urgency ordinance number 21-1058U and introduction and first reading ordinance number 21-1059 implementing SB9 uh, relating to the urban lot split. Uh, at this time, um, I'll turn over to uh, Mr. C Mr. City Manager, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Mayor Yu and members of the council. Um, before I turn it over to our community development director, Scott Reimers, um, we uh, several months ago went through a study session with both you and the planning commission uh, gauging where both the Planning Commission and the Council were in terms of the implementation of SB9. And um, to be clear, this is the implementation of SB9. Uh, we, uh, the Council prior to <clears throat> the adoption of SB9 had vocalized a very strong opposition to SB9 in a letter that Mayor Yu and several other cities throughout the San Gabriel Valley, coordinated by the San Gabriel Valley COG, had uh, vehemently opposed this bill uh, for many reasons that we won't go into any detail today because this is now the law. And <clears throat> what Mr. Reimers and his staff have very carefully done is really tried to um, implement what a SB9 uh, requires, but in consideration really truly of what the community has spoken through the general plan process several years ago, our specific plan. So that in order to do the best that we can to keep the character of the land use and in particularly the single family home communities throughout uh, Temple City. So um, it is not from the council's perspective that they have not 
said they are concerned or they didn't oppose this bill. This bill is now law. Uh, and now we're doing the best we can, despite our previous efforts to really try uh, and, and, and outright oppose the bill early before its adoption. So with that, again, I will, if Mary, you, I'll turn it over to Mr. Reimers to go through his very, I think, has, has captured a lot of what he heard from the Planning Commission during the Planning Commission hearing and before you today. Now, this is an urgency ordinance for the reason that it is adopt, it is effective on January 1st. So if we do not adopt it, it and it, that is at your discretion not to adopt an urgency ordinance, we would default to what the state regulations would require, which are pretty broad and wide open in terms of what uh, they would require of urban lot splits. This takes what we trying to do the best we can to blend some of our standards or some of the concerns we have or the absence thereof uh, standards and, and provisions that are not in SB9 and that we, we are trying to in, um, place in this ordinance in order to effectively administer it in Temple City. So with that, Mary Yu, if it's okay, I will turn it over to our Community Development Director. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kirk. Uh, good evening, uh, Director Remus. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, let me just skip to the next slide. Uh, just background for um, the members of the public who are joining us. Um, the bill was signed into law back on September 16th. Shortly thereafter, the City Council and the Planning Commission had a joint study session to consider it and consider some different alternative um, regulations and give staff some direction. Um, based on that, um, the Planning Commission on November 9th um, reviewed the ordinance and recommended approval to city council. And then just as a reminder, um, the city council had a public hearing on December 7th, but it was continued um, to tonight. Um, because the council has had um, a meeting on this already in the planning commission, um, I'm just gonna summarize SB9 for those members of the public who are just joining, um, but there is a lot of, um, there's a lot more to it than just this. Um, at a, at a large, uh, kind of at a large scale, the, the major change is that now one single family lot can be subdivided into two single family lots. And then you can build two um, single fam, two units, units on each of those lots. So where you once had one house, now you can essentially have four houses um, on that. Um, the ADUs and a JADU would be counted toward that's maximum. So it's not four units, plus an ADU or plus two more ADUs. Um, the new lots have to be um, at least 40% the size of the original lot. And the idea there is that um, the legislature wanted to have the two lots to be roughly equal in size. Um, and the minimum size by law is um, 1,200 square feet for any new lot created under SB9. Um, Required by SB 9 is that the rear and side yard setbacks can be as little as four feet. Um, and the, if there's an existing structure that's going to be retained and possibly subdivided into two units, um, there's no additional setbacks for those existing structures. In terms of parking, um, city, the maximum amount of parking we can require for a unit is one parking space. But if that unit is in um, proximity to a um, high quality transit corridor, we cannot require any parking. Um, any design standards or development standards that the city council does adopt have to be objective. They cannot be subjective and it cannot go through a discretionary review process. So for instance, it can't go to planning commission. We can't have a hearing on it. Um, the owner has to sign an affidavit agreeing to live on the site for three years. Um, by state law, there is no short-term rentals allowed. And um, once somebody subdivides a parcel through SB9, it cannot be subdivided again through SB9. And once someone subdivides a property, um, that same party cannot subdivide the adjacent site. So these are all the regulations um, that are in the law right now. And then now we're gonna turn the page and talk about um, what our um, proposed ordinance would do. So the proposed ordinance is based on five principles um, that uh, we're proposing, uh, and those are to diminish the impacts on infrastructure, assure affordability, 
um, reduce greenhouse gas, air pollution and congestion, reduce environmental impacts and improve neighborhood compatibility. So in terms of the first one, diminishing um, impacts on infrastructure, um, most of the city's infrastructure is aging um, and it was not really designed for a higher density such as 30 some units per acre throughout the city. Um, it was mostly designed as a R1 agricultural tract. Um, and so we have potential for infrastructure issues. Um, state law does allow cities to adopt what's called an impact fee. And an impact fee reduces the impact of new development by charging new development for only its fair share of the impact um, that it is going to have. Um, so we can't charge new development um, fees to pay for existing problems. They can only pay for their impact on um, our infrastructure. Um, so this is not something we can do tonight. We, it does require the hiring of a consultant, a whole study to be done, and then we would need to work with community members on that and collect their feedback. Um, so this is something that we will be proposing in another work plan. Um, work plan. Uh, the second principle that this ordinance is based on is ensuring affordability of these new urban dwellings. Um, so the state um, approved this uh, bill um, because it was trying to address the housing crisis. Um, well, but it did stop short of requiring these units to be held at an affordable right, um, place. So the proposed ordinance that's before you tonight um, would require residents to be low or very low income in order to inhabit one of these units they would have to demonstrate that they are low or very low income. Uh, one benefit of that is that instead of only having low income housing along um, in our most dense areas or um, in only multifamily zones, it helps to disperse affordable housing. Um, uh, the, it's key to know that the original applicant is exempt. The original applicant has to live on site for at least three years. And so they're exempt from this affordability requirement. I think it's also important to know that um, low income in, in Los Angeles County means a family of four that's earning an income of less than $94,600. Um, yeah. Mr. Rima, may I ask a quick question? So when you have this affordability, so let's say uh, I have a, 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 a lot and I divide into, into two and subsequently build four units. I, as the uh, applicant, would be exempt from the income requirement. But if I were to sell these units, the buyer would have to meet this requirement? Not necessarily. The, the way the ordinance is written is that um, the person who's occupying the structure would have to be low income. So it could be exchanged to different parties and those different parties um, can, can be um, a moderate income or higher income. It's just the person who's occupying the unit needs to be low income. Uh, perhaps you can explain how we can enforce this. Um, well, what we did is we pulled the regulations that the city has used in the past for second, the second Newton ordinance. And under the second Newton ordinance that we had um, 10 years ago, we had a number of properties that came through and signed a covenant that it would be held at a low income rate. Um, as part of the ordinance, what we're proposing is that the, the owner would pay a fee um, to have an annual inspection to ensure that the person living there is low income. And so they will need to provide us um, property, uh, I'm sorry, not property tax, um, income tax um, that demonstrate that that family is a low income family. Um, and then they would have to also pay for the staff time to enforce the, that inspection. Okay, thank you. The um, third principle that I wanted to cover is um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution and congestion. And one way that we're proposing to do that is by eliminating the need for parking on site and off site. Um, the benefit of not having parking is that it reduces vehicle trips, so people won't be traveling to and from through um, by using their own cars. Um, it will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, pollution caused by vehicles coming to and from the site, and it would reduce congestion in our residential neighborhoods. It also would support um, walking, bicycling, and transit use. Um, SB9, it's important to note that SB9 does not allow cities to require parking in some instances. And so basically we would just be kind of taking the next step in that and saying that since these were designed for urban environments, 
um, we would take the next step and say that um, the, the people who inhabit these structures could not park on site and they could not get an overnight parking permit. So they could walk to the site, they could bicycle to the site, they could take um, public transit, um, they could use Uber or Lyft or those sorts of ride sharing programs instead. Um, The next principle is um, reducing environmental impacts. So yeah, I, have a, I have a quick question before you go further. So sure. So again, how is this going to be enforced that we that they don't have a vehicle? So it's it's really not so much not allowing them to have a vehicle as it is not having a place for them to park on site and then not providing them an overnight parking permit. So. I would imagine that the intent of this law is to encourage people not to have vehicles. Yes. Um, and so if they do, where will they be parking? Well, um, that, that's a good question. It, if I don't think, first of all, that people who have a vehicle would wanna have one of these units because they wouldn't have a place to sell, to park their vehicle. So they would likely either have to sell their vehicle or park it offsite at another location. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, the, the next principle that this was built on, this ordinance was built on was reducing environmental impacts. Um, when the state passed this uh, legislation, they did not review what the environmental impact of this would be on the state. Um, and so um, we're seeking to mitigate the environmental impact of this development by requiring the new units to um, perform at the level of lead platinum. And what that means is um, when, an, when a site is certified as lead platinum, that would help mitigate the risk to the environment. It would also help reduce the impact on water and power utilities. And LEED is a, an international organization that certifies um, whether a structure is environmentally, um, has a small environmental impact. And basically they have set up an, a point system where um, a project can earn certain points in different categories. And as when that um, point level gets to a certain level, they either reach a certification level or silver, gold, or platinum level. And in this instance, we're recommending the highest level since we don't know the environmental impact of this, which is platinum. So some of the features that might be necessary in order to reach lead platinum, now again, it's, it's up to the applicant to choose um, which types of um, points they want to achieve, um, but it might um, include providing low flow plumbing fixtures, a gray water system, um, LED light fixtures, solar panels, putting in thicker walls or a thicker roof or attic space to provide more insulation, um, ceiling fans, whole house fans, triple pane windows. Um, and then a big piece of lead is also using recycled materials or locally sourced materials um, in order to reduce the environmental impact of these structures. Scott, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yes, sir. This, does this affect the original house that was on that property? I'll have to go back and look at the ordinance really quick and see how it was written. Um, if, they can, if they continue with whatever usage they had for their utilities in the past, will that be affected, I guess? Yeah. It does not apply to, con to the conversion of a structure or to an addition to an existing building. Um, LEED is not really designed to work on additions or existing structures. It's really meant for, for new construction. Thank you. Sure. There we go. Um, and then the last principle that I wanted to cover that this ordinance is based on is reducing um, or improving neighborhood compatibility um, based on the state's the law. So um, it's important to note before we get too deep into this is that the city can set standards, but those standards do need to be objective 
and they also need to allow for at least an 800 square foot unit. So if any of these standards get in the way of an applicant of achieving that 800 square foot unit, uh, then th that standard would need to be set aside. Um, the ordinance that we're proposing tonight includes 16 development standards and 15 design standards. And some of those standards include a maximum unit size of 800 square feet and a minimum size of 500, a building height of 18 feet if it's one story. Um, if they do have to do a two-story building in order to get to that 800 square foot uh, level, um, that height limit would be 25 feet. The second floor of the structure would need to be set in four feet from the first floor, and that's to help reduce the mass of the structure so it doesn't feel so massive. Um, any mature trees on site would need to be pervert, preserved. Um, we wanna make sure that these regulations are also disclosed to future owners. So there's a requirement um, for them to disclose that. Um, there would be um, design standards that are right now specific on to certain architectural styles. Um, so there are very specific standards for Spanish colonial and um, craftsman architecture. Now those standards only apply to these types of units, these urban lot split units. Um, they don't apply to the other R1 structures in the city. Um, it does require a courtyard that's equal to 10% of the lot area and a minimum of 1,000 square feet. And I'll show you an example of what that will look like. Um, and it does um, provide for a prohibition on on-site parking. Um, and one of the benefits that we've seen for that is that when we modeled these projects is that by removing the garage and the driveway from the site, it helps um, reduce the demand on public open space because now there's open space on site. But uh, even more importantly, it helps reduce that need for the project to go up to two stories and even in some cases, three stories. And I can um, show you some examples in the next two slides. Um, so this is an example on a 50 by 150 foot wide lot. So the lot size is about 7,500 square feet. So in this case, the, the building is built around a central courtyard in this kind of brighter green color. And that courtyard in this case is about 1,400 square feet. Each unit is 800 square feet per the state law. Um, it does have the setbacks of four feet for the rear and the side per state law. Um, just uh, so you can see the density here in this case is 23 units per acre. So a typical single family zone would be six units per acre. This is 23 units per acre. And oh, is, that, lot is, that, is that green space there? Is that the backyard or the front yard? Uh, this space up here um, on the right side of your slide where the vehicle is, is the front yard and the street. And then in the okay. back is um, the opposite side. And then this would be a side yard. Side yard. Okay. Yeah. How many units are we looking at? This would have four units. So the front unit faces the street, and then there would be three units that face the courtyard. I have a quick question. Uh, the courtyard is shared amongst the subdivision? Yes. But in theory, a subdivided lot can be sold separately. Yes, yeah. And, and yet the criteria for the courtyard is applicable to the entire lot. Yes. I see, okay. Uh, uh, Director Remus, um, in addition to the courtyard requirement, do we have any more of our permeability requirements that we have for the R1 zones? So this, um, the way this ordinance works is it's kind of like an overlay over the R1 zone. Uh -huh. So the R1 zone does have some permeability requirements. Um, I don't know those off the top of my head. So no, those would apply question. to these projects as well. Okay. Yeah. I, got, I got a quick question. So. In this photo, you've got or this this artist rendering here. You have so this was initially a, a, a one lot, correct? Yes. Which means there was one deed to this property. Yeah. It's now subdivided into two lots, correct? Yes. But does that mean there there'll be two deeds to the property? Yes. And on each of those deeds, there'll be two separate housing units. Yes. And those two separate housing units, at least on this rendering, are going to share an open space. So I would assume that 
somebody's going to have to put up a fence or something. Well, they could, or, or they could not. It's, it's kind of up to them. Um, but yeah. so what we, what we find right now with the tiered lots that we have in the city is that there is shared access through an easement. Um, and that's where the cars drive and access the properties. In this case, the easement would run through the courtyard um, to each to the units in the back. Well, as an attorney, I could see a lot of problems coming up with this uh, from a standpoint of ownership and right to use and a lot of things that could be on the horizon. But it's not our fault, of course. I could see property owners uh, maybe get into some disputes as to what they have or what they can control. I guess that's for another day. Yeah, Sorry, and, and unfortunately, that's that's what we find today with a lot of the tiered lots is there's a lot of maintenance complaints we get that one person is not maintaining the easement or someone's parking in the easement where they shouldn't be. And it does cause quite a problem. Uh, in this example here, we have a smaller lot. So it's the same width, 50 feet, but it's only 100 feet deep. Um, in this case, um, the, in order to get to the minimum 800 square feet that's required by state law, um, it's had to go um, from one story to two stories. Um, like if this, if this project though did require garages for each of the units, um, it's likely that we would see this go up to a third story. Um, in this case, the density is 35 units per acre which in comparison purposes is uh, similar to our R3 density in the city. Uh, Director Amos, um, you said that this is an overlay uh, zone, I guess, but um, so it, uh, the FAR used to be like 35%, I believe for two stories. So that, uh, that would uh, eliminate that 35% requirement, uh, the, uh, this SB9. So on a really large lot, the uh -huh. FAR might be a usable, um, we might be usable, but in this case, because the FAR would keep them from having 800 square feet per unit, the FAR has to be set aside. I see, I see. So this FAR is not really a requirement, but it's, uh, but what you're showing is the result of the uh, subdivision. Right. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, if the council does adopt the urgency ordinance tonight, um, state law and that ordinance would go into effect on January 1st. Um, if the urgency ordinance is not adopted tonight, then the state law would go into effect on January 1st and we wouldn't have any local regulations. Um, on January 4th, um, we're proposing tonight both an urgency ordinance and a regular ordinance. So um, the council, we're proposing the council adopt the urgency ordinance tonight and then hold a second reading for the regular ordinance on January 4th. And then, um, as I mentioned, our recommendation is to, um, to approve ordinance, the urgency ordinance 1058U and um, do the first reading of ordinance 21-1059 um, and then to schedule the second reading of that ordinance on January 4th. And with that, I'm available if the council has any additional questions. All right, thank you. Um, I'll go through the uh, city council for any questions that uh, you may have, um, starting with council member Viscar. If you have any questions for... Uh, um, I was just wondering on those two stories, if there's a garage involved, there's a square footage of, of the garage become part of the 800 square feet? So if the if there is a garage, um, then that has to, then we have to allow the garage plus 800 square feet. So, so then there's, that's why we're thinking that when we modeled it originally, that in some cases we would see a, a potentially a third story. I, I didn't understand that. The, 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 the square footage of the garage is included in the 800 square feet? No, it's, it's excluded. Okay. Uh, all right, that's all I have. Uh, may, may I just uh, jump in and ask a follow-up question to that? Um, I thought uh, garages are not allowed. 
Well, if if the council adopts staff recommendation, then a garage would not be allowed. I see. Okay. So the order says this excludes garages. Yes. Okay. And the state Thank ordinance, you. the state ordinance, or our ordinance? Uh, uh, just our ordinance. Our, our ordinance does oh. does not allow garages. That's correct. Well, what would you need a garage for if you don't, don't have parking? Right. That's why it's excluded. Uh, okay. Well, um, Councilmember uh, Chavez, do uh, you have any other questions? No, thanks. Okay. Not at the moment. Okay, Councilmember Min, do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe as a follow-up to the garage question, is it accurate to say that um, if garages were allowed, then you would, I guess the, the effect it would have is that people would build up, right? Because they're saying, well, if I put in the garage, I can't get my 800 square feet on this property. So you have to allow me to build up. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and not, not just the garage by itself, but then also dri the driveway can eat up in some cases up to 20 feet in width. Require, um, the LA County Fire Department in some cases requires a 20 foot wide driveway, um, which eats up a lot of space that could be used to develop the property. Right, because yeah, I, I think for, for maybe most, I wanna say most people might not be used to the idea of not having a garage. Um, but I guess I, I wanted to ask you that question just to show what the effect it would actually have. Because if, if the goal was to, like you, you mentioned a lot of aspects of our ordinance is to try to at least regulate the massing of the structure and massing is kind of directly correlated with whether you have a one story or two story, right? Um, so it's kind of like a, in my mind right now, that's kind of like a pick your poison kind of, kind of deal. You know, you, you want to give people garages, but you increase the mass massing of the overall R1 zone, or you decrease the massing and prohibit uh, the construction of, of garages. Okay. Um, actually, first, I, I want to thank uh, Director Reimers for um, actually helping me understand this uh, prior to the meeting, I did ask a lot of my questions then, uh, but maybe just um, for, the, for the purposes of the meeting, um, if you can indulge me in repeating maybe a couple of the questions that I asked you. Um, one of my questions was regarding the enforcement of uh, the owner occupying the structure or the owner not subdividing adjacent lots. Um, how will we handle or distinguish um, properties that are under an LLC or a trust? Yeah, and in those cases, we would have to require the applicant to disclose all the members of the trust, um, or all the partners in the LLC, um, so that we could determine whether they are also then a part of any other application or any subsequent application. And so would we, by definition, then consider any guardians or owners of the trust to also be interpreted as owners of that property? Yes. Well, there's okay. no such thing as a guardian of a trust. Um, I might use the wrong term, yeah. Well, First whatever. Of all. Trustee. Hmm. It, well, the, the name's on, on, on the trust, I guess. That's what I'm trying to get at. Trust, it's the trust doors who are on the, on the title. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Yeah. No, it, it never mind. It doesn't it doesn't. Yeah, because I, I I imagine a, a trust could have multiple names on there. So would all those names be considered owners? So, and as far as I understand, the answer is yes. That's how we would. Look at yes. It. Yep. Uh, thank you. And um, just a general question about the uh, the impact fee. I know we're not there yet, uh, but can you help us understand um, in terms parameters that control an impact fee? How much input does a city have or is it a formula that the consultant simply follows and you just plug and chug the numbers? 
Sure, the, the process is a bit formulaic now. Um, it's been well adjudicated, uh, the process. And so um, what goes into it um, is pretty much formulaic. Um, so it starts with a process of looking at where, what infrastructure we have, where are there deficiencies, what infrastructure would be needed um, in order to serve the general plan build out numbers um, and what, how much development is, is likely to occur um, during that time. Um, and then you take the total cost of the bill divided by the number of units, and then you essentially charge each unit um, their, their fair share cost. Now, typically because so many um, cities uh, have uh, a large infrastructure need and the cost of land is high, um, for instance, especially with parks, in order to, to purchase a park and build a park, um, in a city like Temple City, where we're already poor, park poor, um, the, the cost for the open space impact fee would be quite high. And so um, once that high number is chosen, um, then typically we go through a process with the community and with the council on commission to look at what is an appropriate fee to charge. And a lot of cities will typically start that at a very low amount. And then over time, they progressively increase it to give the time for the market to correct. And in addition to that as well, there would be some level of legal analysis to ensure the appropriateness of the level of the fee as well um, and the appropriateness of the fee as well. Thank you. And um, I, I think uh, in if you could maybe reconfirm, but essentially SB9 um, does not allow cities to consider I guess infrastructure impacts, um, and and what I what I mean by that is I think I had asked you, um, you know, what about the impact on the electrical grid, on the water supply, on the sewer system, and, and essentially SB9 says nope, none, none of that matters, right? That that's correct. Yeah, we cannot deny an application um, based on the utilization of of water and power. Um, those are assumed to be. Um, provided in what's termed urban areas and we fall within an urban area. All right, and um, I guess my, my last question is, um, this one really piqued my interest was, someone can subdivide a property under the existing subdivision act and then subdivide again under SB9, is that correct? Yes, yes, if someone had a very large parcel um, they could potentially subdivide it or go through a lot split. Um, and then after that was completed, the next owner, it would have to be a different owner, the next owner could then um, accomplish an SB9 lot split. Okay, so it's, it's, I guess it's important to distinguish that there are actually two different subdivisions now that SB9 is introduced. There's the original subdivision act under the state and then the SB9 subdivision treats a separate process. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. And, and the last one, I, I know there's not a great answer for, but um, you know, how, how does this affect trash collection? <laughs> um, we, we now have three bins per household. And so if you have um, four units on the same lot, you'd have 12. That's a lot of trash cans. <laughs> Yes, it, it is. Um, we don't have anything in the ordinance right now about trash service. Um, it's something we could potentially add to the second reading ordinance um, if the city attorney was comfortable with that. Um, but a set, um, we, we also could put something in a set of guidelines about um, requiring a dumpster um, for the, the shared lot. Um, so the two units would share a dumpster and the back two units would share a dumpster. And that would help reduce the number of cans coming out on trash day. Okay. Still, still could get pretty messy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist. Uh, any questions for staff? I right, you on mute. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. How about just a couple of clarification questions, picking back on the, some of the things that's been asked. 
Um, so for the um, impact fee, so the fact that we pass this ordinance tonight will not preclude the city from assessing after some study and analysis, uh, future impact fees, right? That's right. Okay. And second part is that the SB not explicitly exclude uh, any kind of um, CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act kind of analysis. Am I right? Yes, so CEQA only applies to discretionary actions and this is not a discretionary action. So CEQA does not apply. Okay. And that's why we really have no control over what kind of impact there is. Right, but right. Um, but yeah, actually on um, Council Member Men's question on dumpster, I'd be very curious, you know, whether or not you can even hold that many dumpsters uh, or many trash cans in the back if you have four units and you only have four feet as your backyard. Um, I think fire department may have a heartburn over, uh, pun not intended, uh, you know, because the uh, side yard actually in the uh, residential development is actually used as a secondary exit. So mm -hmm. if you've got um, trash cans, uh, it might be a problem, but, but that's not for us to worry about, I suppose. So, Do we, uh, Mary, you, I just had a couple of quick follow-up yeah. questions. Do we need to add something to this ordinance requiring uh, an area be set aside for these trash cans? I thought that, that might be a good idea. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, it seems it seems that it, we've already identified it as a potential problem. Why not add language to the ordinance that requires, uh, I don't, and I don't know if it's allowed under the state law or not, but to, they got to put them somewhere. Yes. And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know if we can fit that in somewhere and, and, or not, but that would certainly solve that dilemma. Um, I do have a question just real quick on the parking. Um, I know that uh, the city cannot require more than one parking space per unit and then can't re cannot require any parking if there are three conditions met. One is a half mile walk to a high quality transit corridor. I can't remember if I saw that uh, defined anywhere. What, what would be an example? Do we have a high quality transit corridor in the city? There is um, two areas of the city that are within a half mile of a high, a high quality transit corridor. Um, and so that's the area down south of Lower Azusa um, by Gidley and Bisbee. Uh, that area is within this um, section. That don't on Lower Zusa. Yeah, just south of Lower Zusa. Okay, south of Lower but isn't that El Monte? No, there's a small triangle of the city that's um, that's within the area. Yeah. Okay. Ellis so Lane and Bisbee and Gidley and those streets down there. Okay, so that's one area. And then there's another area where Santa Anita Avenue is considered a high quality transit corridor. So any properties within a half mile radius of that street um, would fall within an area where we could not require parking. And, and where would a major transit stop be? A major transit stop is an area that has headways, um, bus headways of less than 15 minutes. Do we have any of those in the city? Yeah, just those areas that I mentioned. Just the same ones. Avenue and, um, so those, and so those two small ones. Right. And then what is a car share vehicle? A car share vehicle is something you don't see much of in our area, but in more urban areas, um, you'll see them. It's where a car is left on the street. Um, and then somebody can use an app to uh, unlock the vehicle and use it for a day or an hour or two. And then they bring it back to the location and then another person gets to rent it on an hourly or daily basis. Oh, I, must be, I must be getting old because I have never in my entire life heard of that. <laughs> is that, uh, I mean, uh, that, that, is, that is mind boggling to me. Councilman, you may have seen them in Pasadena outside. under the name Zipcar. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, they have had Zipcar parking in the Lake Avenue area of Pasadena. Uh, really? It all went away after about two and a half years because they weren't getting the numbers they wanted there. But uh, they did try to roll it out where some of the new density in Pasadena had been put in. Didn't, didn't we used to refer to this as car burglars? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
And, and let, let me just add, with respect to the trash can situation, I given how sensitive this ordinance is, I think if we make any substantive changes right now, uh, we would want to bring it back for a new first reading. Uh, to avoid that, we may want to direct Scott to do a director's policy regarding the trash. And then as we watch the SB9, uh, you know, watch how the state deals with it and perhaps up, updates it in 2022, we can bring an update to our ordinance back uh, to put his policy into the code. That might be the best way to deal with the trash can situation. No, and, and I have no problem with that. It seems to me like we're just trying to get a, a, a placeholder and we have to do some cleanup later on. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Vince. All right. Thank you. Uh, I will now open up for public hearing. Um, I will ask any member of the public watching at home to call in at the Zoom number. Once you're on, the city clerk will make sure you're able to speak. And Madam Clerk, are there any public callers? And I believe there was at least one that wanted to speak on this. Yes, Mary, there are two callers and I've requested them to unmute if they wish to speak. So callers, please uh, unmute your phone and please state your name and we'll call on you one by one. We have, sir, we have Franklin, Mr. Franklin Rudell, he's requesting yeah. to speak. Well, I have numerous questions, um, Mr. Um, Hoof, the mayor. Um, it seems to me that you actually could have a garage above a garage and still use it for other purposes, but at least you got away with it because it was a garage. It was one of my items. Um, another one is that we've, that it's really dolled me on several things over the last few years. We elect, have elected officials who owe a duty to us, but yet they seem to give up their duties to honor what the state is saying. I, I don't get that. I think that something needs to be sought about that. Um, I, I, I liked your attitude on the on the um, trash um, cans and and um, having um, rollaways, but rollaways take up street. So where's the where's the fire engine going to drive? So there's just a litany of things here that that uh, I I just I just can't see it be workable. We we have a we are a flag lot. At the same time, I'm not sure that we even have an easement across somebody else's driveway to get out of that flag lot. Um, I I think also that maybe somebody should be presented build some, I mean, draw up some drawings that would be feasible that those of us who already have properties, what we need to do. Um, you may find a bunch of vacant lots and people leaving and you wouldn't have anything. Um, th this, this is very impractical in my mind. Um, I don't know if anybody kept track of all that I've said or not. I, I just uh, don't see it, see it workable. From, from the state perspective, I mean, if you're if you're building a, a brand new area, that, that then you can do something with it. But an area like ours, it's already been preset in time. I've been here since uh, '44. Um, it's there, there, and you know, before the city was a city and school district was a school district, etc. So it's it's not an improvement; it's it's a downgrade. Well, what, what do we, what do we work for? Well, I, I see it. I just wanted to express that frustration out of it. I think, I think to me, it would be real help for us who, who do decide to, oh, we're going to stay with it and live with it. What, that what is, that I think that's going to overload the city when we come to them and say, well, now you tell us what we can do and what we can't do. So that, that's where I'd like to see you go for the next meeting, please. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rudell. I appreciate the comments. And uh, going on to our next caller. And Madam Clark, who is our next caller? Mayor, you have asked the caller to unmute if they wish to speak. 
Um, yes, I wish to speak. Can you please state your name, please? My name is Ewan Taylor. Hi, I'm Ms. Taylor. Hi. Um, yes, um, this is a loose, loose, loose proposition. This is a loose for the state because it creates disincentives and hardship for those who want to increase housing supply. It's a loose for the city because it drives away capital and investment. It's a loose for residents because this is depriving them of a way to hedge against inflation. This proposal reflects some questionable assumptions about what should be done to residents who want to increase housing supply. And here are three changes at a minimum to correct for inequities that are in this proposal. Number one, the maximum size should be increased depending on the lot size. 800 square foot is not enough living space for a family with children. School districts statewide are facing declining enrollment. Families with children bring more funding to our schools. It is better for children to live in a house than in an apartment. This will be a win-win. Secondly, remove the affordability requirement. The math just doesn't make any financial sense. Based on the median income for LA area as of 2019, the owner can charge a max rent of $1.20 per square foot under this proposal. All costs associated with real property development, repair, and maintenance have skyrocketed. Even corporations are entitled to a 5% plus inflation rent hikes under California rent control. Residents here are not corporations, and they don't have such deep pockets where they can subsidize their tenants for 30 years. People are watching their savings be eaten away by inflation. If investing in Temple City is not profitable, then they will just take their money and invest somewhere else. Just like companies, jobs, and workers are moving to Texas, other cities will get the new houses, new influx of money, and more funding for their schools. And thirdly, we should allow on-site and more street parking. The elimination of parking is punitive for families with children and those who cannot work from home. We do not live in an area with easy access to an advanced public transit system. Every one of us should lessen our environmental impacts. That burden should not be unfairly borne by a targeted group. Finally, instead of taking a punitive approach to a residents who want to split their lots, we should make ADUs a more attractive option for them, starting with not counting ADU in the floor area ratio like our neighboring cities. Please make this strategic decision to attract capital and families with our, ordinance, with our ordinances, not to drive them away. By making it punitive to develop residential properties, we as a city are part of a very serious problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Anyone else would like to address the city council at this point? I'd like to have a copy of that, if I could. A copy of? Of what he said. I, I, I think, think that what he said was excellent. I think that's in, going to be in the uh, city record. Um, I think uh, Madam Clark can address that better, but I believe that's in our record of, uh, of our meeting. Mayor? Yes. Can, I, I'm a little confused here. Um, Mr. Rudell, I, I thought I heard you say that you thought this whole idea of, you know, of what the state is allowing to be detrimental to you as a homeowner, but um, Ms. Taylor, who just spoke, had an entirely different viewpoint. So are you, I, I'm not sure where exactly you stand. Are well, you I in stand favor? against the issue to begin with. And I, I'm, I'm not sure which part you're, you're talking about without rehearing what I said. Um, well, I'm talking I, about, I, yeah, I'm not really sure if you are for what the state has imposed upon municipalities or you're not in favor of that. You mean of SB9? Yes, increasing density and lot splits. And no, I'm, oh. I'm not in favor of that, no. Okay. So and you I understand that what Ms. Taylor said is she is in favor of that. Well, let me let me. I, I just wanted to make better. sure that you that I understood where you were coming from, and I understand where Miss Taylor is coming from. 
Yeah, well, economic. all that all that I heard that you were saying was to adjust SB. I thought anyway to adjust SB nine to meet the requirements that are already out there. The new requirements some of, some that just went into maybe Greg, if you could maybe clarify. Sure. Uh, Senate Bill nine goes into effect on January one. And what Mr. Remers has put together is an urgency ordinance and then a permanent ordinance that will fit within what Senate Bill 9 allows local government to do to provide some guidelines or some limitations on the new units that we have to allow to be constructed under SB 9. Um, both in the study session and then in, in the presentation today, what we're talking about is there are a lot of things that SB9 will not let us do anymore to stop uh, what some people might call overdevelopment of single family residential neighborhoods. Uh, so in light of that, Mr. Reamers held the study session and then came back today with an ordinance that would uh, meet, you know, comply completely with state law and also with the state's purposes in adopting Senate Bill 9 um, to give the city a bit of control and give developers a bit of guidance as to what they can do and not do in Temple City when they want to do these urban lot splits under SB 9. Uh, Scott, have I said that correctly? Sir. Thank you, Greg. I have yes, a question, but go ahead. Yeah, mute, 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 mute. Yeah. Unless there are further callers, um, I think the um, public comment period is over. Uh, it's limited only three minutes. So I just want to make sure everybody would get a chance to speak. Madam Clark, are there any other callers? Mayor, you, there are no other callers. Well, at this time, then I will close public hearing um and then go back to the city council for final questions and comments uh, starting with council member viscara i really don't have any more it's just, this seems inevitable okay council member chavez you where shall i start uh okay um first of all I would like to thank uh, those who did speak up, the callers. I appreciate your comments. But unless I'm missing something, this is a state law. This is not something that we initiated. And in fact, as the Brian, Mr. Cook uh, stated earlier, we vigorously opposed SB 9 when it was first put on them out there. Okay. And so, you know, there's this old term preaching to the choir. And while we appreciate the comments, and we probably, most of us, and I don't want to speak for my colleagues, probably agree with most of what you have said, okay? Um, it's not really how our government works. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're at the mercy many times of state laws, okay? What we are trying to do here is to mitigate the impact of what we believe is a ridiculous state law. This law, at least to me, is intended more for, quote, urban areas. And what I mean by that, or at least what, is, what I think of an urban area, is if you go down downtown LA and you walk out of your place, there is mass transit, there are restaurants, there are everything that is there, okay, which is what this is all about. That does not apply to Temple City and never will, at least not in the foreseeable future. Um, and so what we are trying to do here, contrary, I think, to what some of you may be believing, is that we and staff have done, a, I think, a very good job, including our commissioners, and taking a look at what state law is requiring and trying to mitigate what those requirements are so that they fit a little bit better with our city. And that's about the best we can do right now. And in fact, as we may see in the future, some of the things that we are doing now may be challenged by the state. We don't even know that yet. Um, 
And so, you know, it's, it's one of those areas, again, and this is not the first time that a local government has been affected by some state politician who sometimes can't see beyond their, the tip of their nose and to see exactly what the impact is gonna be on local government. And, and that's exactly what we have here, but it is what it is. And we're doing our best to deal with it. And of course there's more to follow. And um, you know, um, we're gonna continue doing what we can to make sure that uh, you know, Temple City continues the way we have a great place to live, a great place to have your children, a great place to go to school, work and play. And uh, I'll get off my soapbox for now. So. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chavez. Council Member Min, any final questions or comments? I could probably go on for hours about this, but I'll try to keep mine short as well. Um, I think Council Member Chavez said it well. I think the, the general sentiment uh, is that we, we don't think SB9 is really conducive to our neighborhood. And in fact, We've always talked about how our single family R1 zones is, is kind of a feature, a characteristic of what makes Temple City the neighborhood it is. A lot of people move here for that. Um, and SB9, at least in principle, is dismantling that uh, before our eyes. Um, However, um, I, I, I do think, um, well, first of all, I appreciate the, the comments. Um, I think the comments may have confirmed one of my hypotheses about what might happen with SB9. Um, um, I think Ms. Taylor mentioned you know, high construction costs uh, and market variables. Um, I think we're assuming that SB9 is going to radically transform Temple City in, in a short period of time. The truth is, I don't think nobody really knows what SB9 is going to do. Um, my, my hypothesis is that because our land value here is high compared to some other areas in the San Gabriel Valley, that the economics of lot splitting and building in accordance to not just the proposed ordinance that we have, but just SB9's go in general, it doesn't seem like it would pencil out for, for a lot of, um, I mean, you call them developers, flippers, whatnot. Um, that, that would be my guess, because I, I think the affordability component of it, um, I, I'm not, I, I guess someone would have to show me the math to, to prove that that will work out. Um, so, so I, I don't, I guess I don't want to jump to the conclusion that that's, that's what's going to happen, that, you know, every single R1 lot is suddenly going to become, you know, four units built to the max. Um, it, it, we're still too early in that stages. Um, but uh, I guess in, in general, I, I am in agreement with the ordinance that staff has, has put together. Um, I think it's a good starting point. Um, I think a lot of the concerns that were discussed tonight, there still needs to be a significant amount of work done to investigate and look at um, what more are we allowed to do as a city? Um, what is the state going to do in response to cities passing a whole smorgasbord of different ordinances? You know, how are they going to treat each one individually? Because I'm sure all cities are having a similar discussion that we are having now. Um, so how, how is the state going to enforce SB9 uh, and in what manner remains to be seen? Um, so I, I look forward to um, the next steps that we can take um, to really stay with the spirit of the general plan that we had put together several years ago. And SB9 is, in my opinion, clashing with the intent of the general plan that we as a community put together. I mean, the general plan was not dictated by council. This was a, uh, this was a vision for our city that was put together through a multi-year process with massive input for our residents. So I think it's safe to say that that input still reflects 
how the residents feel. And, and that would mean that most of our residents would probably not be happy with what SB9 is trying to do. Um, so um, having said that, I, I do, um, I guess maybe one other question I forgot to ask is um, regarding the impact fee. What, how long does that usually take? And would that process potentially change depending on how the state might try to amend or like I, I just, it just seems like such a fluid, potentially fluid situation. So how long does an impact study usually take? Uh, sometimes it can depend on the amount of community outreach and community interest. I would say between six and 12 months. Six and 12 months. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, <laughs> um, I, I don't have much else to say, so thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mayor Pratem Sternquist, any final questions or comments? Um, just a final comment. I think that it's really the best that we can do at this point with what the state is requiring and what the majority of our residents would want as uh, people who came to Temple City for you know, that bedroom community. So I think that it, we should move forward with this. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I certainly agree with most, everything's been said and I really appreciate Council Member Chavez expressing the sentiment and how this is a state law. So as a city, we really don't have much of a control over, over that. Um, you know, I really appreciate some of the calls you called in, some expressing frustration, some expressing, well, we're not making this workable. But you know, SB9 is a state law, like Councilmember uh, Chavez had put. I mean, it is not something we desire. And uh, we as a community have worked very, very hard through general plan, through public hearings. And over the years, we have really created, uh, in, in my opinion, and thanks to uh, Director uh, uh, Reamer's uh, recent work as well, we really have generated a good um, guidance, a, a, a formula to moving ahead to maintain our neighborhood uh, character. But SB9 kind of treated us just like any other cities. And unfortunately, uh, we are Temple City. We're not just any other cities. And, and then to treat us just like everybody else is really not workable. And there's also one other thing that I think is fundamentally flawed with SB9. You know, I appreciate the, the desire to make housing affordable, but there's one fundamental flaw in my opinion that uh, SB9 had failed to address, that is the economy of scale. Making single family homes four plexus is really not the way to go. I mean, you really want to make it affordable, you make, you know, you really a target, you should, should target all threes and higher density housing. This is neither here nor there. Um, and one of the callers talk about ADUs and JADUs. They, that, those laws are still on the books. If somebody want to come along and want to do an, just an ADU, um, and they can follow those rules. And what we're doing tonight is to do the best we can, given the SB9 and given their spirit of making housing affordable, and, and not requiring us to do any kind of environmental, environmental analyses. And uh, as Mr. Rima had um, uh, eloquently put together those five implementation uh, uh, philosophies, I think we are complying with the spirit of SB9, making housing affordable, yet at the same time, we're balancing it with what we desire um, as, as desirable. Most of you have told us um, for City of Temple City. So I agree with everything that's been put forth in that. Uh, and I, but I must say, I really appreciate the callers uh, calling us and addressing us. So with that, um, I am ready for a motion. And, and just before we go ahead, go ahead I'd, I'd like us to do this in two steps. Uh, one, if we can deal with the urgency ordinance and then second, uh, the permanent ordinance. So if you're looking at, say, page 
three of the agenda, uh, item number one under recommendation would be a first motion. And then after we address that, items two, three, and four would be your second motion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murphy. And was that the motion? Oh, no, sir. I would never do that. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. I would make a motion that we introduce and read by title further, wait for the reading and adopt urgency ordinance number 21-1058U. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, it's moved and seconded, Madam Clerk. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Viscara? Uh, Council Member Viscara? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Yu? Uh, yes. And then I'll follow that up by uh, making a motion to introduce ordinance number 21-1059 for first reading by title only, amending title three, chapter three, title nine, chapters one and two of the municipal code that we waive for the reading of ordinance number 21-1059 and schedule the second reading of ordinance number 21-1059 for January 4th, 2022. Okay. First time I've said that, 2022, wow. Wow, uh, do we have a second? Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Uh, Madam Clark, roll call please. Yes, Mayor. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Mann? Yes. Council Member Vizgara? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Yu? Yes. Uh, Madam Clark, uh, please read the title of the urgent Urgency Ordinance 21-1058U and Ordinance Number 21-1059. Thank you, Mayor. Urgency Ordinance Number 21-1058U and Ordinance of the City Council of City of Temple City, California, amending Title Three, Chapter Three, and Title Nine, Chapter One and Two of the Temple City Municipal Code to provide for urban dwellings and urban lot splits. Ordinance number 211059, an ordinance of City Council of City of Temple City, California, amending Title Three, Chapter Three, and Title Nine, Chapters One and Two of the Temple City Municipal Code to provide for urban dwellings and urban lot splits. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, so we move on to the next item, which is unfinished business. There is none. And next item is new business. Uh, which is the adoption of resolution number 21-5573, providing for the appointment of nominees to the Office of City Council that were to be elected on Tuesday, March 8th, 2022, and canceling the city's general uh, municipal election on that date. Um, Madam City Clerk. Good evening, City Council. As of close of business on Friday, December 10th, the deadline for filing nomination <coughs> papers, the only candidates to file the required nomination papers were the two incumbent for the Office of uh, Council Members, that's Council Member Chavez and Mayor Yu. Per California Election Code 10229, if by the nomination filing deadline, the number of persons who have been nominated for those office, offices does not exceed the number to be filled at the election, and if there are also no qualified ballot measures, then the city's election officials, election officials shall submit a certificate of these facts to the governing body of the city and request the governing body that at a regular or special meeting held before the municipal election to adopt one of the following courses of action. One, appoint to the office the person or persons who has or have been nominated. Two, appoint to the office by eligible voter if no one has been nominated. Or three, determine to hold the election if either no one or only one person has been nominated. The city council's decision must occur by the 75th day, which is before December 23rd, before the municipal election. Otherwise, if no person has been appointed to office pursuant to actions one or two above, the municipal election shall be held. Tonight, the city council is requested to adopt the, uh, the proposed resolution and exercise option to appoint the nominees to those office 
offices and to cancel the March 8, 2022 general municipal election. Um, with that, I'm available if council has any questions. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, let me start by asking the city council if you have any questions, uh, starting with council member Viscar. Really don't. Uh, I'm assuming you and and uh, and council member Chavez would want to be appointed. That's is that that's correct? correct? We uh, submitted our nomination papers. Correct. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, council member uh, Chavez. Too late to withdraw the nomination papers. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, so you're saying yes, I guess it is. Okay. Damn. All right. There we go. No, I have no questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Min. Uh, no questions. Thanks. Mayor Pro Tem Stenquist. I have no questions. And I don't have any questions either. At this point, I open up the floor for uh, public comments. I'll ask any of the member of the public watching at home to call in at the Zoom number. Once you're in, the city clerk will make sure you're able to speak. Uh, Madam City Clerk, are there any public callers? I don't see them on my screen at this point other than Mr. Riddell. That's correct. I don't have any comments. I'd be interested in the other lady who was spoken if she, if she had comments. I don't see her on the screen now. I thought she did an excellent job in presenting her, her side in case of the story. It was cool. Thank you, Mr. Riddell. Um, so when nothing more from the public and the reasonable time have been given for them to call in, I will close public comment and bring it back to the city council for discussion. Uh, any council final questions or comments, I'll call it uh, start with council member Biscar. Uh, <clears throat> no, I have no questions. Council member Chavez, questions or comments? No, thank you. Council member Min. Uh, well, I'll just say uh, thank you both for willing to continue to serve. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist. Um, same thing. Just thank you both for willingness to serve, especially during these times. It's challenging, but um, we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I do, um, you know, appreciate the opportunity to serve and uh, looking forward to four more years. So with that, um, do we have a council motion? I'll make a motion uh, to cancel the regular scheduled election. Was that March, 2022? Yes, March 8th. March 8th, 2022. And to appoint the two nominees, Mayor Yu and Council Member Chavez to a four-year term, and I believe there was one other item. What was yeah, that one? Adopt, adopt resolution number 21-5573. Yes, and adopt that. <laughs> okay. All right, do we have a second? Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Thank you. And Madam Clark, roll call vote, please. Yes, Mr. Councilmember Chavez. Yes, thank you. Councilmember Mann. Yes. Council Member Viscara? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist? Yes. Mayor Yu? Yes. Well, thank you very much uh, for the for that. And then moving on to next item, which is a discussion regarding initiation of a municipal co-amendment relating to maintenance of vacant properties. Uh, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor Yu. Um, and I will turn this over to uh, Mr. Reamers again. If I, so uh, Mayor Yu, if that's okay, we'll turn it over to Mr. Reamers. Yeah, uh, Director Reamers. Uh, you are mute, uh, Director Reamers. Very good, thank you. 
Um, yes, tonight uh, we're just looking for council interest in whether we should initiate a code amendment on um, vacant properties. And so I'll just walk you through some parameters of what we understand, and then we'll take um, a motion and any direction that you wanted to give us on this. Um, they just wanted to tell you what we already have on the books in terms of existing regulation. Um, so Temple City Municipal Code um, section 4-2i um, was adopted during the Great Recession to deal with properties that were in default or foreclosure. Um, that ordinance required properties to register with the city um, so that we would have kind of a list of properties that we needed to keep an eye on um, to make sure that there were no public nuisance um, issues on those sites. Um, and so within that ordinance is a list of things that cannot um, occur on those sites. Um, we don't have presently have any um, properties on that list in that register. Uh, section 4-2C of the Temple City Municipal Code is the general public nuisance requirements. And that section of the code prohibits conditions such as overgrown vegetation, graffiti, trunk trash and debris, um, unmaintained swimming pools and such. So all of these things would apply to properties that are vacant and properties that are currently being used. So um, we do have some vacant properties uh, in the city. Um, we have some properties that have been vacant for a very long time. Um, sometimes we see that um, these vacant properties are located in areas that we're specifically trying to perform some economic development activities, such as in the downtown core or um, in the crossroads specific plan area. And on some of these vacant properties, there really are no plans for construction. Um, it's in some cases, it's a former site of a building, um, but there might also be times when the vacant property is a building that's just not have a tenant for an extended period of time. And so this ordinance um, seeks to address um, issues on these types of properties. And the purpose of the ordinance is to minimize and prevent blight to promote economic investment and to improve aesthetics. And it would potentially do that by um, requiring some fencing around the site. Uh, so in this example below, um, this is in a nearby city. Um, you can see that they've um, provided some fencing uh, near the property line, but it's also been set back. And in that setback area, there's been some landscaping that's been provided to help soften the look um, to kind of uh, reduce the feeling of blight in the area. And then um, this ordinance would potentially also include some requirements for regular maintenance. So fencing, um, the type and height is to be determined. Um, the amount of landscaping and how deep that landscaping area would be um, is um, still something we haven't researched what other cities require um, in relation. Um, we're thinking right now that this ordinance would only apply to non-residential uses and properties, um, but uh, it could be expanded to perhaps um, construction sites um, that are stalled. Um, right now, we're thinking it would apply to undeveloped lots and um, structures that are vacant. The time period for that vacancy, we haven't determined yet whether it's vacant for more than a year or more than six months, but. I don't think um, if a site's vacant for a month, we would require them to you know, put in significant um, improvements. And so um, I know this is just a sketch at this point, um, but before we put a lot more work into researching this, um, the code does um, allow us to come to you and just um, make sure that we're all on the same page and that we should continue to move forward on this um, ordinance. So we're asking for any direction you might have, any questions you might have and want us to research and to give us direction on whether to initiate um, this amendment to the code. With that, I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you, Director Reamer. Um, I'd like to uh, see if the council has any questions. So I'll start with Council Member Viscara. Provide direction to staff on whether to initiate an amendment of, uh, uh, regarding additional maintenance standards for. How specific can we get on the, the additional maintenance standard? And, and there's, you know, there's a couple of properties that we're all familiar with. That we've been hoping something would happen, and it hasn't. I'm wondering to what degree can we push that? 
Uh, something I've seen in one city's code is to require them to um, visit the site regularly, um, potentially monthly. Um, but it's just really to make sure that there's no public nuisances that exist, that there's no junk, trash, and debris on the site, that the landscaping is being maintained, that there's not leaking sprinkler heads, things like that. That's what I've seen so far. Can, can we require demo, any demolition? Uh, yes, the under the existing public nuisance section, um, buildings that are uh, under construction and where construction has stopped for an unreasonable period of time, or structures that um, structures that are vacant for an extended period of time or in a half stage of demolition can be we can require de demolition of those properties. How about lots that have big slabs of, of concrete? Hmm. <laughs> Uh, potentially, I'm, I'm narrowing right, but, down here. <laughs> <laughs> but potentially, um, that's something that might require a conversation with the city prosecutor's office. But, yeah. With who I couldn't hear you, Scott. Uh, sorry, the city prosecutor's office. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, that's what but, I'd like to see. Yeah, if we had a structure that was um, half demolished, something like that, then most yeah. definitely we could require them to demolish the entire structure. Can you take or anything? And that's, that's something we've actually done um, in the recent past. Well, if we could take it a step further, I think that would be good. <clears throat> that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Viscara. Um, going, moving on to Councilmember Chavez, do you have any questions for staff? Uh, no questions, thank you. Councilmember Mint. Any um, questions? No, no questions at this time. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist. Questions? No questions. Thank you. Yeah, I, I too don't have any questions. Um, I and I may make a comment uh, later on. I'll open up for public comments. I'll ask any of, member of the public watching at home to call in at a Zoom number. Once you're on, the city clerk will make sure you're able to speak. Madam City Clerk, are there any public callers offering comments on this item? Are you, Mr. Franklin Rudell's audio is enabled and there are no other callers. Okay. I just just have a question. When uh, Mr. Rudell, go ahead. Uh, your, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Maybe I spoke up too soon. Um, my question is, it seems like when these th things happen, it's many times due to financial issues. The city step in and try to not loan or money, but get that financial issue taken care of by through the banking interest in the city or something. I'm just throwing it out as an idea. That's all. Okay. Is that all the comments you have, Mr. Rudell? That that was that was my comment. Yes. It, okay. I, thank you. It, I know uh, the the air. The area that I'm thinking of is there on um, Temple City Boulevard, across the street from that area that that's been where the old where the market burned and all that area has been vacant for so long. The, right. the city approved certain things to be done, and they never got them. And I think they're still in the same position. I don't know. I saw I've seen a little bit of construction, but very little. And I, I just have often wondered: Well, is there a way that you can spike it by getting some? Because I'm sure. It's has something to do with the banking issue and them not getting their money, their loans out. So is there a way that the city can help them proceed just because they are the city? That's all. That's all I was asking. Maybe it's a... Okay, thank you. Appreciate the comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Madam Clark, are there any other callers? Because I certainly don't see it on my screen. Mayor, are you there are no other callers. And so we've given the public sufficient time to call. So I will close public comments. Uh, going back to the city council, final questions or comments? Council member Viscara. No further questions or comments. Uh, council member uh, Chavez. Yeah, I, um, I would support uh, some additional, I guess, um, research on this. Uh, I'm all for developing uh, new guidelines, especially for some of these areas that have been vacant for extended periods of time. Anything that has to do with any health or safety issues, 
So um, I certainly would be in support of initiating or looking at any possible amendments to our municipal code concerning the maintenance uh, standards for these for these properties. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Min. I guess I do have a question. Um, would Director Reimers, would you would you say it's accurate to say that the proposed ordinance is mainly aesthetic improvement to these uh, vacant lots? It's I mean it seems like we already have ordinances in place that um, prevent public safety and public health hazards, uh, as, as you mentioned in the existing code. So what would any additional improvements we add to the ordinance be purely aesthetic in nature, or is there something that our current ordinance does not capture in the sphere of public safety and public health? Yeah, I, I think the um, the ordinance has two prongs that are kind of tied together. And one prong is obviously an aesthetic improvement, but I think anytime we make aesthetic improvements to the city that has some you know, economic development and adds some economic vitality to the city. So I think these are the two key pieces. Um, at this point, I don't, uh, I don't, see any health and safety issues, but you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not as creative and I need to think about it a little bit more. And, and as, as we do research, we can look and see if there's some health and safety improvements that could be made. Okay, because at, at least in the uh, example uh, provided in the slide, because um, I, I was actually wondering visually what that might look like. Um, so that, that was helpful. Um, but to me, at least what it's, what it's suggesting is that you have a fence and then you just have landscaping in front of the fence. Um, so I'm just trying to understand if, if, if that's the direction we're, yeah, we're, I, we're heading. I, I think that's the main component of the ordinance, but I think also when we when we require um, property owners to invest in their property, whether that's through just you know, monthly maintenance of it, um, then at least we know that someone's visiting the property um, regularly. Um, we know that um, even if it's just a gardener, there's, there's some relationship to the property that's taking place. And that often can create a better sense of um, health and safety on the site because we know it's being maintained. We know that there's, um, you know, people aren't just dumping trash there and, and so forth. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I know we probably don't have all the answers right now. This is kind of broad-based question, um, but I think my comment would be, I, I would be, I, I would wonder how we would enforce something like that, you know, because a law is only as good as us being able to enforce it, kind of like our previous discussion about owner-occupied housing, signing affidavits, so on. So, uh, I think the the or what, what we're discussing here seems well intentioned. Uh, I just I guess my question would be just uh, from a practical standpoint how how that would be implemented or or enforced. Okay. Um, uh, I guess what I would say is I'm kind of neutral on this issue. I I don't think it would ever occur to me to that we needed something like this. Um, but I'm certainly maybe just professional curiosity just to see what, what is out there. Um, I don't mind keeping an open mind about what we can do. Um, but, but I kind of like a lot of things that we've talked about in the past. Um, is, is it really something we want to legislate? Um, I think it's, it's really the fundamental question. Um, that we need to discuss in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Prostem, uh, Prostem Sternquist, questions and um, comments. Um, I have no questions. I, I do have quite a few um, comments. Um, I, I mentioned this to Brian and asked him to bring it forth 
to city council for consideration. There was an article that um, I believe it was the League of California Cities. Um, and I tend to read all of this stuff, but it was the city of Pico Rivera. And I know the mayor well there. And um, so I had the opportunity to talk to him about what the reasons were regarding why their city took an approach to um, have an ordinance in their city similar to what's being proposed. And um, it, it just really made a lot of sense. I, I think probably why I'm the most sensitive to, to this is in particularly in particular the alpha beta site because I probably pass it two to three times if not more a day. Um, as many of you know, I own property that abuts up to um, the Alpha Beta, the old Alpha Beta site. And from a health and safety standpoint, I think Brian, our city manager, has probably had a minimum <clears throat> of 15 calls from me to tell him that there has been excess dumping of um, furniture, uh, you name it. Um, it. There is just so much stuff that goes, people shove through the chicken wire fence, put stuff over that fence. Um, we have invested quite a bit of effort in, in um, developing Primrose Park. I cannot imagine having a beautiful park adjacent to such a horrid dumping ground that has been like that for so long. I mean, yes, there have been plans, the city has tried to encourage to um, have the owners of this piece of land do something for the last, how many years is it now? 45 years, I believe. And just to pretty much close a blind eye. And the city is the one who has taken responsibility for cleaning up that site. I mean, Brian is excellent about having staff go out there and take care of the mess that's there. So I do think that having an ordinance like this um, is something that the residents of the area would appreciate. And not on only the residents, but the people visiting the park, having to look at such a mess on a day in and day out basis. Now, as far as aesthetics goes, the um, Scott, the slide that you showed that had a green fence within the greenery with on the outside. I mean, I think that's a, a pretty simple way of dealing with it. I don't think it would work well for the alpha beta site, in, especially because that green fencing deteriorates and people put graffiti as Brian, you know, I've called you numerous times about the graffiti on the Primrose Park site. So I think there needs to be some creative ways to think about exactly what could go around the perimeter of the area. Maybe you only do it on, you know, if you're gonna put green greenery up and then the green fencing, you leave an area visible because if you have it all closed off and the greenery does not prevent anybody from climbing over the fence, then you're gonna have a problem with homelessness near the park. So maybe the idea is they have to plant like bougainvilleas, which are bright and beautiful and people cannot climb on them because they're prickly and it hurts to climb over. So I think those are ways that the staff can be creative and working with, you know, the, the owners. But I think to leave a site looking like that adjacent to a beautiful park in itself and knowing firsthand that it is a dumping ground. I do not know about the other sites that are in our city, but this is Temple City Boulevard. I mean, it is a a street heavily traveled from people off the freeway going north up to Pasadena. I mean, I just think we should take more pride in what that site looks like also. And 
hopefully by having the owners improve the aesthetics of that site, the areas across the street, the little commercial area will say, hey, look it, you know, let, let's fix up our spot. We talked a lot about having that area, the commercial area there redeveloped into something that was, you know, more, I don't know, more appealing to the residents. And I don't think there's an incentive for the people who live across the or have the businesses across the street to really do anything or get some viable uh, tenants in those places because of what they look at across the street. So I think the city of Pico Rivera has done it right. It passed unanimously with their council and other cities in the COG are now looking to Pico Rivera to see how they are going, you know, what, what they are going to do as far as design standards are. So they just approved an ordinance and I think they are continuing to develop with the owners of the property what the best idea is. And they're not looking at it to be punitive to the owners, but to actually work with them and have them have a dog in the fight of making the city as nice as it can be. Are so they, that's, that's they my soap opera. Are they providing financial help to the owners? I, they are not providing financial assistance, but they do have, you know, pretty strict guidelines, if you will. I mean, if somebody, you have to have had um, the property vacant and, you know, not looking great for at least over a year. So, I mean, they've put some things in place to work with the owners. And if you look at it from being more proactive with the owners than it being punitive, I think we'd get a lot further. So um, I can definitely have staff reach out to um, the mayor, to Gustavo, Gustavo Camacho, um, to talk to him about you know, how they are continuing to implement the ordinance. But it, it seems to be something that other cities are looking to because almost every city has blighted vacant property, especially through COVID and just economics. But that's it for me. I mean, I, I just think it's a really good approach to enhance what is probably going to stay vacant for quite some time. Thank you, uh, Mayor Potem Strenquist. I, 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 too, think there's merit in investigating how effective uh, such, a, such an ordinance uh, is. Uh, I'll be curious what other cities and what success they have. And, but yet at the same time, I, I don't want it to be overburdensome for the property owners. And, and, and like uh, Mr. Rodell pointed out, I mean, they, uh, they're not developing because they are, their private financially is not working out and uh, to impose such a burden on them, uh, we'll, we'll see. But yeah, at the same time, um, we all have, we all, as property owners, have a responsibility to keep up our property. And um, at some point, I think the vacant property owners needs to have also have that responsibility um, to the rest of us. Because after all, we are, um, as a city, we are keeping, you know, like providing a lot of um, services, whether it was intended. Or not. So, um, do we actually need a formal council motion or this is something that um, um, Mr. Reamer and Mr. Cooking bring back at some point? I believe we can take this without a motion um, going forward. I think we hear the majority of the council speaking for bringing this forward and having a further discussion. And that gives us time to do a complete and thorough analysis across the board with this ordinance too and its impacts. All right, thank you, Mr. Cook. So I'll move on to the next item, which is update from Mr. City Manager. Mr. Cook, any updates for us? For thank council? you, Mary Yu. I'll, take, I'll, I'll be brief, but I have a few. Um, 
congratulations, Mary Yu and Council Member Chavez. I look forward to working with you uh, going forward. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you to uh, both our city clerk and our deputy city clerk who worked very diligently to prepare us uh, for a, an election. Um, we were going to have to do a standalone election and it was a lot of work that both uh, Ms. Quo and Ms. Nunez put together to prepare us for that. And thank you to them uh, for all the work they've done over the last about, you know, extended period of time before the election. So thank you to them. Um, secondly, um, Mayor Pro Tem Sternquist and I have participated in a couple of the redistricting, uh, county redistricting uh, public hearings, providing testimony. And on, <clears throat> excuse me, on December 15th, uh, the commission voted on a final map that included uh, Temple City remaining in Supervorial District five, which has historically been for quite some time. So um, you should be receiving a letter from the supervisor shortly, letting her know that you will, that the Temple City will still be represented by her, her staff um, and for at least the next uh, election cycle and 10 years through until the next census. So um, thank you to Mayor Pro Tem. We, there was a, uh, some waiting on some of those commission meetings where a lot of public comments. Luckily, we got in early a couple times. So <clears throat> on the COVID front, um, we don't see Mr. Er Mr. Erzumi is actually, he doesn't have COVID. He is, has a, just a regular flu. <laughs> so he is out of it today. But um, uh, on that front, we, you've seen some of the newer restrictions that the LA County Health Department has put on on mega events and um, indoor, which our indoor masking pol uh, policy, at least in the city has been very consistent for city facilities, um, but is uh, countywide. So please be safe. Uh, Mr. Matsumoto, you want to talk real briefly about the uh, clinic we just had recently? If you're there. Oops. Yes, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, we recently had our, um, COVID-19 and flu shot vaccination clinic. Uh, that was done in conjunction with the Chinatown Service Center. Uh, that was back on uh, Friday, December 3rd at Live Oak Park. Uh, overall, we had a pretty good turnout. We had 97 uh, total vaccinations administered, uh, 42 of which were uh, walk-up uh, vaccinations. So that was great as well. People just uh, being at the park and uh, stopping by to uh, get vaccinated. So uh, we had all three uh, vaccinations, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we provided both, both first dose and booster shots. So uh, we have an agreement with Chinatown Service Center to continue uh, vaccination clinics. So that's something that we will be exploring into the new year. And that's everything I have. Thank you, Mr. Matsuvato. That's my, uh, my trick in keeping uh, the executive team on their toes there, calling on them without giving them a heads up. Um, lastly, uh, I just wanna thank you as a council for your leadership through another year of a pandemic. Um, thank you for your support of staff and our operations. The operations and our continuing service to the community cannot be done without our, my, my thanks to the entire executive team for providing great leadership throughout in implementing the vision and the policy of the council, but also our programming and getting through the day-to-day. -day. Getting through the day-to-day -day has not always been easy through the pandemic, and they do it, they do it with a smile, they do it with, um, with hard work. Um, and then by extension, all the way to every member of staff. Um, it is because of them that we've been able to provide that day-to-day -day service. Uh, a prime example of that was our last weekend, and I'll speak for Mr. Arizumi and thank him for helping out during the rain, the big rainstorm, one of the biggest we've had in a while, where at the last moment we had several trees falling down and pretty much within hours, the roads were cleared um, and everything was cleaned up. And that's because of a real strong team approach across departments to ensure that we're providing service to the community, but also keeping the community safe. So thank you to all of them, our tree crew, our public works crew, 
and our parks maintenance crew working together as a one team, not worrying about what duties they had or anything else, but really focusing together. And that collaboration is exemplified across the city with a, across City Hall. And that's um, is <clears throat> been one of the primary reasons why we've been able to get through. So thank you to you and the council. Thank you to my colleague, uh, Mr. Murphy and his team on the on the city as your city attorney and our labor attorney as well for helping us get through this year. That, and happy holidays and happy new year to all of you. Thank you. That'll, that concludes my report, Mayor Yu. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Um, next item is update from Mr. City Attorney. Uh, Mr. Murphy, any updates for us? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a few, uh, uh, kind of my first report on the legislation that was passed that affects city operations uh, or could affect how, <clears throat> how the city functions. First, the state budget uh, allocated another $250 million for Project Home Key. As uh, many of you know, Project Home Key takes existing properties, uh, oftentimes uh, underperforming hotels and motels, and turns them into housing for currently homeless people. Uh, obviously a wonderful idea, but there are some potentially tricky issues for cities uh, that lose uh, the tax implications of a hotel or motel and see that turned into a uh, residence. Uh, so we'll be keeping an eye on the few motel or few uh, hotels that the city has. Uh, and obviously uh, most of Project Home Key is operated through the county, although the state uh, does do a few projects on its own. So we'll be making sure that we, we keep abreast of what the county's plans are in our area um, so that we know what's what's going on in that regard. Uh, Assembly Bill 149 uh, deals with street maintenance. Uh, as the council knows, there are annual state allocations for street maintenance, and those generally require a city to show that it has been making minimum expenditures in previous years. Uh, Assembly Bill 149 lifts or modifies significantly the expenditure requirements uh, taking into account the pandemic's effect on our ability to, to keep up that street maintenance. Uh, so for the next few years, as Mr. Cook brings you street maintenance plans, you'll see that, that modified quite a bit. Uh, Senate Bill 503 significantly changes the rules for vote by mail signature verification. Uh, that's some, this is something we'll be working with the city clerk's office on. It now actually takes uh, two people to uh, do a signature verification rather than just the elections officer herself. Uh, so we'll be, be working to make sure uh, that in now two years and three months, the next time we have an election uh, that, that we'll be following Senate Bill 503. And then finally, this deals with our employment law issues. Senate Bill 331 uh, actually limits the use of non-disclosure and non-disparagement clauses in employment uh, uh, settlement or employment uh, agreements to terminate employment uh, where there have been claims involving retaliation, harassment, and discrimination. So uh, in light of that, we'll be modifying the way that we, we walk through um, uh, termination agreements or settlement agreements uh, when those kinds of claims are in place. Uh, that's my report for tonight. We'll have another one in your next meeting and we'll just keep walking through uh, some of the things that, some other fun things that the state has done uh, to local government, uh, setting aside uh, your main item for tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Happy holidays and everybody stay dry over the next 10 days. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, um, Mary, can I ask Mr. Murphy a quick question? Yeah, please. Uh, regarding the, the bill that alters our contribution to street maintenance, um, just order of magnitude wise, how significant is it? You know, I, I would really need to go through and look at at, at the specific details. The, the kind of the, the way it was presented to us was this is really good news because for many of us, we haven't been able to keep up. Uh, I know, you know, Mr. Cook's done a good job of, of keeping that going in Temple City. It may mean very little to Temple City, but it, it, it was presented to the city attorney's group as a fairly big deal and something worth looking at. Uh, so I plan to look at it 
as we're coming in with the budget for next year and what that would mean. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Moving to next item, could you council reports regarding ad hoc or standing committee meetings? Do we have any reports from ad hoc or standing committees? Looks like we don't have any, so I'll move on to the next item, which is um, council item separate from the city manager's regular agenda. So starting with council member Viscar. No, I don't really have a, have anything in particular, although I was, I was thinking about our previous discussion and especially the, the comments that council member Sternquist brought up if in fact we want to create a committee or uh, for a working group relating relating to that uh, subject, I'm available and would be glad to participate. Um, beyond that, I'd like to wish all of you a, a good, safe holiday and a happy new year. And I guess I'll see you all next year. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Chavez. Thank you. I just want to thank, uh, big thanks to all my colleagues for their support and trust. I uh, look forward to serving the next four years with you. And uh, same with as far as uh, our staff, uh, Mr. Cook, Mr. Murphy, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll see what the next four years will bring. Can't be any worse than the last four, I guess, huh? Or maybe it can. I don't know. Or the last two. Ah. Anyway. Yeah, last two. Yeah, exactly. But uh other than that, uh, that's it. Uh, happy holidays, everybody. Stay safe out there. And, uh, and again, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, if not sooner. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Min. Uh, thank you, Mary Yu. Uh, just one quick thing. It's not, it's not a, I, I'm part of the uh, school district's uh, preschool advisory committee. It's, it's not a city appointed committee, so I didn't report out during that segment. Um, but I, I figured it'd be interesting to keep council and everyone in the loop. Uh, so basically the committee was formed uh, by the school district because they're looking into opening a preschool, kind of a, almost daycare preschool kind of program, ages three to five. Uh, today we had a short meeting, um, not a lot of very substantive items were necessarily discussed, uh, but they, they do have an ambitious timeline uh, of trying to make this available the fall of 2022, which is yeah. next year. <laughs> so I, I think I read that correctly on the slide. But um, anyway, the, the site that they're looking to do it at is, is the old Doug Sears Learning Center. Um, so I'll, I'll keep everyone abreast and uh, they did mention today that um, I guess one of the issues they'll, they'll reach out to us for is uh, managing traffic flow and drop off points. So um, I think they mentioned they'll be reaching out to, uh, to, to you, Brian, about that. And, uh, but besides that, um, yeah, uh, I just wanna wish everyone a happy holidays, Merry Christmas and um, stay, stay safe and well during this uh, Omicron, Omicron variant peak and hope to see everyone next year. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Strenquist. I'd like to share that in my role as chair of Foothill Transit's executive board, I was asked to come out to the Arcadia yard yesterday and greet Congresswoman Judy Chu who um, came out and, and spent a, almost two hours at the facility looking at the Foothill Transit double-deckers, um, had the opportunity to really spend some quality time with her. We um, chatted for you know, quite some time about um, what was going on in DC and she shared that there is going to be so much money coming down the pipeline for transportation projects. And if there were things in our cities that pertain to transportation, we should definitely get some plans in place. And it made me think that um, we could definitely use some funding to increase our um, EV charging stations in our city at different locations. And she was very supportive of that. She shared how much she enjoys 
the Temple City Council and coming out to visit our city. And it was just a really nice visit. Um, you know, I usually get to spend about five or 10 minutes in passing with Judy, but we actually sat in the double decker bus and spoke for a good half hour on just different things. And um, it was really nice to hear that uh, she is really fond of our city and the work that we do here. And so if we could think of some things that we could have in place when these uh, grants are made available, then you know we're a step ahead. So she encouraged our city to take a look at anything that we could do to help with um, transportation infrastructure and um, getting people to where they want to go in a while reducing our carbon um, imprint. So definitely she is all aboard for electric vehicles and going green. So I just wanted to share that with all of you and have a wonderful holiday season. I know this time is both beautiful, but it can also be very stressful. So let's all try and reduce our stress and just enjoy what this season is all about and family, faith, and um, really just being kind to one another. So take care and have a beautiful holidays with your family. And that goes for all the residents out there. Yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Temp. Um, yeah, I also want to wish everybody happy holidays. Uh, but I also want to share one other thing. The um, Governor Newsom's office actually did reach out to uh, Temple City. So um, today I have had a video conference with Mr. Cook uh, with their uh, Director of External Affairs, uh, uh, Ms. Priscilla Chang. And she happened to actually know Temple City quite well. Um, we um, really have a short meeting, but uh, we touch on a couple of things, including SB9 and how um, we feel about the state uh, taking local control from us. Uh, we also talked about the uh, possibility of getting more fundings from, uh, from, from the state uh, for infrastructure projects. So, um, so that was a, actually a pretty, pretty good meeting. Uh, it wasn't contentious at all. And we do thank him for uh, his work during the pandemic uh, as well. So, um, and speak of a uh, pandemic, I want to thank staff for a very successful COVID um, vaccination uh, drive. And it's um, actually, I have visitors actually happen and actually that, so uh, my daughter-in-law was actually one of the walk-ins. So we were very impressed with how uh, it was organized and, um, and how uh, Mr. Cook been keeping the, all the air filters throughout the, our, our community center it was very impressive. So thank you. So, uh, and again, uh, thank you for your confidence and looking forward to four more years uh, to serve on the council. So wishing everyone, including the public, um, a, a very happy uh, and safe new year as well. So uh, with that, I will move on to our last additional public comments. Um, so at this time, if you want to address the council, uh, please call and we'll give you a minute. Congratulations, um, Vincent and Tom. I wanted to share that. Oh, thank you, Mayor Britton. Really appreciate the confidence in us. And um, it's been great. So looking forward to four more years. I had a question of um, on uh, the SP9. Is there any way the public can know in advance to help you um, more control how it ends up coming out instead of we knowing at the end how we have to obey it? Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Cook, you were going to say something? Sure. Um, I'll be happy to talk to you, Mr. Riddell. I know we've talked in the past. Um, again, the measures, uh, the measure that the council took tonight, again, and as was articulated earlier, was not in support of SB9, in, 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 but in, in no, implementing SB9. I, <clears throat> I just we, didn't know what the lead time that you had in order to do what you did. I thought, well, if, if the state, if you knew at the state level and you had, I don't know, what, four months or six months, whatever it would be, you could um, get more of the public involved to lead it in a way that, that would be more acceptable for you. That's all I was trying to say. What I'm trying um, to say. We actually did not have the four months that you were referring to, Mr. Riddell. So um, it was. Well, that's, that's what I didn't know. That's, that's why I asked. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for your good job, too, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Riddell. Um, with that, I will close public comment and adjourn tonight's meeting and wishing everybody a very happy holidays and a happy new year, safe and healthy new year. Um, see you all next year, I guess. <laughs> Thank you.